Um, really appreciate everybody showing up for this. Um, hoping that my voice is going to hold out for a full hour of talking. And unlike some presentations where we've been online, uh, you know, over the past two years, um, there's no safety net. Like there's no cheat sheet. There's no notes that you can have on that second monitor where you're in your bunny slippers with your cats. Um, so this is this is going to be fun. We know that this is a great audience. We know that this is an amazing group of people. Blue teamers are the best out there, of course. Um, so really excited to share with you the content that we've got for today. And and I have figured out how to work the clicker. So we're going to be talking about eleven strategies of a world class sock. And I actually want to start off by talking about what we don't mean by world class sock. Because you might be thinking, oh, I've only got two people on my team, or five, or we do security as you know, kind of other, other duties is assigned. And the fact is, it doesn't matter how many people you have in your organization. I have worked with SOCs that have upwards of 100 people and they are completely dysfunctional. They don't know where they're going. They're not rowing in the same direction. They aren't collecting the right data. They aren't, you know, figuring out what they need to be doing for their organization and for their business. So you can be small and you can be great. The next thing is you don't need to have the biggest budget. You don't have to have all the latest tools. I actually think we've got somebody tomorrow that I met yesterday who's gonna be talking about open source tools tomorrow. Like there are a lot of options out there. So we're not gonna be talking about go buy this technology, put this in place. Again, you can be small and you can be scrappy and you can be amazing. And the other thing is we're not saying that a world-class SOC is one that tries to do all of the things. You know, if you're an organization and it doesn't make sense to you, to do detailed malware analysis, like that's not in your threat model, that's not something you can do, that's okay. You know, you don't have to do everything in order to be amazing at the things you're trying to do. And so our statement is that a world-class SOC is one which excels at the things as a charter to do, not one which is trying to do all of the things. And so we're hoping that today, you know, whether you are that small two-person team, whether you are you know, a global organization that does around the sun SOC operations in multiple locations, whether you outsource some of your SOC functions, whether you have people within your organization outside your security team that do some, that we're gonna be able to share some ideas with you that are gonna be relevant to everybody who's here and everybody who's online with us. So as mentioned, uh, we do have a third um, author um, who is an equal partner in all this information, Catherine Nerlis. She couldn't be here with us today, but we wanted to make sure that we acknowledged her. And we also want to acknowledge that even though, you know, between Carson and Catherine and myself, you know, we've been doing this for a while, there are so many other great people who inform the content that we're sharing. Coworkers past and present. Um, if you go in and you take a look at uh, an online document, you're going to be able to see some of those names. And I want to dive a little bit more into what was brought up as we were introduced, which is some of you may have heard of the book, 10 Strategies of a World Class Sock. Um, we did dial it up to 11 for this version. It is a follow-on version, um, but we didn't just add one strategy. You know, that original book came out in 2014. It was an amazing set of work at that point that Carson put together. But we recognize that in eight years, a lot has changed. And so we did refactor this. This is new content. We took a look at every word on every page. Uh, we created new strategies, we consolidated some, we took some out. Um, and so Carson at the end, we'll give you all the, uh, the details, but we're not selling anything. There is a free PDF of this book that you can go get. So we're not here as, as sales folk. Um, we really just wanted to share all of this content and make it available to everybody. Now, I do have to put up the legal disclaimer, uh, which says this content was you know, done with MITRE support, um, but the, we're not speaking on behalf of our employers, past or present, any opinions expressed are our own. So if you don't like them, get on Slack, let us know. We will be happy to chat about it. Um, you don't need to reach out to our companies to, to complain about what we said. So the 11 strategies, what are they? Where do we start? When we thought about putting these strategies together, um, we had whiteboards filled with ideas, all the topics that we wanted to cover. And what we decided to do was try and tell a story. Start from the beginning. What's your foundation? How does a SOC even get started? You know, what are those things that you're trying to do, you know, to recognize your role of the SOC in your business organization um, and to make sure you've got the authorities needed to do your work? We then started thinking about, okay, what's the structure? What's the staffing? What do you even look like as you're organizing this, this SOC within your organization? Um, we started thinking about core functions. These are not the only core functions that your SOC might do, but these were two that we thought were particularly relevant to you know, the, the whole uh, story that we were trying to tell. 
And then of course you have to get into data and tools. You know, there's so much data, so many tool options. Uh, I think one of the latest statistics is most companies have 56 different security tools that they might employ at any given time. Um, and then finally, we think about how do you elevate? You know, how do you connect with others? How do you move and evolve within your own organization? And so as we're telling this story, um, we hope that, you know, wherever you are in your own personal journey, there's going to be something that resonates here. So if you're that person who suddenly finds that they need to build a SOC, great. We've got a story laid out for you, and we hope you'll find it useful. If you're a student, and I know from being on Slack this morning, there's a lot of folks that are newer to this industry still. Welcome. We hope this is going to be a reference, a place to get you started, a place you can come back to and think about all the different elements and maybe where you want to specialize or where you want to ask more questions. And if you're an experienced practitioner, you know, please don't just open up your laptop and go, eh, I've seen this all before. Take a moment to think about your own organization. And is it time to go back and relook at some of these areas? Is there something that you could take away here or that you could teach to somebody else in your organization who maybe doesn't know as much as you? So we're going to go through all 11 strategies. They gave us a full hour, so we're going to try and fit them all in. Um, I will uh, switch back and forth with Carson. We're going to try and keep it interesting that way. Uh, here, finish us out. But I'm going to get us started on strategy one. And so this is know what you're protecting and why. And this strategy underpins everything that we're talking about today. And it's really about having that business mindset. Thinking about the context of why something's important, you know, why you want to be protecting it, how are you actually going to respond when something happens? And what I want you to think about is in our industry, we think about getting to the left of the adversary, you know, figuring out what they're doing before they get there. Well, what if you got to the left of your company? What if you started knowing, hey, you know, this is what my company looks like. This is what, you know, we're going to be doing a merger and this company is going to come online you know, who has different technology stacks than we do? What if this consolidation is going to happen? And so think about how you get to the left and how you think about your organization in the context of what you're doing within your SOC operation. And then you need to think about this because there is so much data coming in. There are so many, you know, only so many analysts out there. We all know that there's a staffing shortage. Um, and the more you know about your organization, the better you can actually automate what you're doing successfully, because you're not going to be making choices that are going to harm the business functions that you're trying to do. And so you can automate a response action. You can shut down a user's email. You can turn off a system. You can make some choices that are going to be really well-informed and really steeped in what your business is doing and have the buy-in from your stakeholders to actually take those actions. And then, like I mentioned, this is going to be part of all of the strategies that we have going forward. So if you're thinking about incident response, well, you're going to be responding for a particular user group within your organization. If you're thinking about data, you're going to be driving the data you need to collect. If you're thinking about communications, this is going to tell you who you need to communicate out with. And so think about this you know, with our chart here in a, in a couple ways. The first is the threat. We actually have a whole strategy on threat intelligence, so I won't go into this too much. But this is really you know, what your adversaries are trying to do. These are the external forces that are putting that pressure on you. The second part is regulation and policy. Uh, not the most fun topic, um, not encouraging any of you to be lawyers. You should have a, a legal team, hopefully, that's going to help you with this. But you do need to understand if there are requirements for actually uh, doing reporting, collecting for a certain amount of time, collecting from a certain location. And then finally, you have the hard part, and that's what you're protecting. That's your mission. That's your, you know, and then your data and your technology and your users that are supporting that mission. And when you're thinking about these, think about, you know, with your users. Are they uh, users that are all corporate? Or do you have contractors that come in and also have access to your information? Think about, are they all in one geographic location or are they around the world? Do they travel? Should you expect their logins to be coming from a certain location or be moving constantly? You know, may, and that's gonna differentiate depending on what part of your organization. Your salespeople may look very different than your engineers. And obviously the data and technology, that's the one that we focus, I think the most on, uh, but we wanna encourage you to think well beyond that because yes, it's important to know, you know what your mail server is. It's important to know, you know what applications your users are running. 
Um, you absolutely have to know, has your company moved onto the cloud? Are they doing SaaS applications? You know, where, what's happening in that space? But then you apply all of that into your mission to think about whether it actually matters. So I wanna tell you a story about the absolute worst piece of cybersecurity advice or recommendation that I ever made. Uh, luckily, this was many, many years ago, so I, I've grown past that. But I was working at an organization that was really proactive in trying to think about cybersecurity problems. And our leader brought in a whole group of us. You know, I was a junior analyst, they had uh, engineers, they had network admins, they had senior advisors, they had our legal team. And they said, okay, we have to get ahead of this. What can we do? I want you to be really aggressive, really think about what we could do. Broke us off into teams. And in our team, what we started thinking about is, okay, so where, where do all these threats come from? And at that point, like network protocols were the thing. We hadn't gotten to endpoint yet. We hadn't done anything else. We were still, network traffic is where you started. And so, you know, somebody said, well, everything's coming across port 80. You know, that's like a real problem. And our network guy said, yeah, you know, it's April and I just got those stats from March and March Madness, you know, happened and we saw this huge spike. And I don't think anybody's using, you know, this internet for anything other than like, you know, checking their own email and going to see what the scores are. And so I said, huh, I wonder if we blocked port 80, what would happen? Okay, yes. <laughs> those of you more experienced right now are going, how did she ever come up with that? Um, I was new, I didn't know. Yeah, and we were asked to be creative. So I said, okay, let's bring that up. So we brought it up and um, our leader who at that time did not have a lot of cybersecurity experience because a lot of people were moving into the industry from other roles, started to seriously consider it. And they started going, huh, we could do that. We could like, you know, what would that take? How would we communicate it? Would we do it permanently? Would we just try it for an hour? Like, yeah, people could let us know. And thank goodness. We had somebody who actually was not a techie, was not a lawyer, was not a policy person, who actually had worked in that organization. And like, um, did you know that our engineers actually control their equipment across Port 80? And uh, they, they can't open and close the gates if that doesn't work. And we're like, okay, well, we could write an allow list, we could write an exception. And then they said, um, did you know that weather information comes across that way? And we have people that make decisions about whether to run an operation based on that. And we're like, okay, we could write an exception for that. And then somebody else said, um, you know, did you know that our learning platform runs across there? So all those people that need to be trained out in all those satellite offices, all the field offices, you know, they kind of use that too. And we're like, oh, okay. So we did not understand our users. And luckily our leader said, why don't we just put a pin in that? We'll come back to that idea. What else do we have? Um, and so that's a, I mean, that's a pretty broad brush thing. It's obviously not as applicable nowadays because hopefully the glass were indicated that nobody would want to shut port 80. Um, but it really does highlight the fact that, you know, we need to be able to understand our constituency, to understand the business needs and to use that in the context of the decisions that we're making. And so the question is, how do you do that? And so you want to do that first by being curious. You know, this is a great skill for life, so we want to bring it up here too. And being curious means actually look at the org chart in your organization. Know what those business units are. Go find a salesperson or listen to a sales talk and see what they're pitching. What are they selling? Read the newsletters that are sent out. You know, maybe there's two organizational groups that are merging and, you know, one makes widgets and the other does a dog walking service. And now they're coming together and you're like, huh, is that going to change the accesses, the controls, the way that this information is being shared? And so you can start by being curious, but then the next thing is you really need to think about that composite, that asset inventory. And this is hard. This is something that, you know, even if you're the most mature SOC, you are probably still working on this because a lot of this data isn't available to the SOC natively. It's gonna be over in other systems. It's gonna be hidden, you know, with your IT department. It's gonna be places that you don't natively have access to. And so what we wanna do is encourage you to think about getting that information as a real engineering challenge. You know, think about it as much as you think about your, you know, your SIM deployment or your data collection strategy and really figure out what do you need to go get and where can you get it from? And as you're doing that, start small. You know, maybe there's just a couple assets that you're gonna be able to manage. 
you know, and you're going to put those in a system. Maybe it is just that org chart that you're going to be storing. But you build upon that until eventually you've got enough information that when something comes in, you can make a decision that is really, really well informed. And so I want to leave you with this thought, this mindset as you're moving forward, which is the SOC should be able to put any cyber event it observes into constituency context so that it can effectively prioritize its action. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carson so he can jump into the next set of strategies. Hey, folks. Um, so I'm going to talk about the actual the strategy that changed the least from first edition, and that is give the SOC the authority to do its job. Um, ultimately, we need a, a piece of paper or more, much more likely a series of pieces of paper that give the SOC the following. Um, it, they're designated as the one and usually the only organization responsible for incident response to, and detection for their constituency. And when I say constituency, I'm referring to the set of organizations, users, businesses, et cetera, that they are protecting. They need to be the decision authority for incident response. By contrast, they need to have at least a vote in prevention so that when the next patch is coming down, the next vulnerability is coming down the line, they have the ability to say, hey, we should probably do something about this before it's an incident. They need to be able to communicate directly with whoever they need to. They need to be able to acquire, engineer, deploy, operate, tune, and upgrade their own tools. I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit. They need to be able to collect, retain, and share the artifacts relevant to their investigations. And that at the same time, they need to exercise these authorities with a whole lot of care and precision, right? I'll never forget the time I was in a SOC and they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna stop an entire class A because we don't know anything better to do in response to this given attack. And I'm like, you might wanna rethink that strategy, right? We've always, we've all been there, all right? The way you codify these authorities um, may change depending on your culture. Sometimes you have to write it down in excruciating detail for all this in some other places, maybe brevity is more appropriate. I'm also gonna talk about number three, build a SOC structure to match your organization's needs, your constituency needs. And this ranges as Ingrid implied earlier, from SOCs that are two people in their spare time to national coordination centers. There's a whole menu of functions to pick from here. And there's a lot of questions about how do we organize? In fact, we completely redrew that set of functions for the second edition. Don't write all this down, folks. You can go get it in the book. The point is, is that there's this menu of 41 different functions. Some are totally new, by the way. What are you gonna choose? because you're not gonna do all of them. And what we're providing here is a framework to think about, hey, based on the kind of stock that I am, where do I need to be landing here? At least as a starting point, is that optional? Should I really be doing that? Is it a really bad idea to do that? There's some functions that certain SOCs should just never undertake. Like if you're a two person shop doing, doing security operations in your spare time, you probably don't wanna be thinking too hard about deception, shot in the dark, right? So food for thought. We wanna think about physical location, remote, remote work. Many of us, if not all of us have been, been doing some kind of remote work over the last two years, I know I have. We wanna think about 24 by seven coverage models. There's a big st stigma in our industry. If you're a SOC and you're not 24 by seven, you're like, you're looked down upon, right? So that leads us to a conversation about outsourcing. And what are our expectations about outsourcing? We can't necessarily bring all of those capabilities in-house, right? We may not be able to keep a malware analyst on staff, okay? Um, so there's different, there's different approaches there. I'm gonna drill down on a couple pieces here. There's a, there's a truth I've learned over the years and it kind of goes along with strategy one. The further the analyst is organizationally, physically, et cetera, from the assets and networks and cloud resources that they're required to defend, the poorer their understanding 
what is normal, and thus their ability to understand what is abnormal on those networks, cloud resources, systems, assets, et cetera. The point is you've got to know what's going on. And this creates tension because on the one hand, we want a big sock that's consolidated all these people and resourcing and authorities and specialization. On the other hand, we want a smaller sock that understands and has that context. So the question is, is how do we um, achieve that balance? And that challenges us, and we have to keep that in mind when we consider the following. I've said it in first edition and I'll say it again. In fact, this is one of the most fire and brimstone things I get about, but I have to temper it. The best approach, frankly, but not the only approach, one of the best approaches is to bring all elements of security operations under one roof. And here's a little cartoon that talks about what that looks like. Every SOC is structured differently, of course, but ultimately you want one set of people reporting to one person and that person's job is security operations, only security operations and nothing but security operations. And they're talking to each other because we want one team and one mission. And we want, we want sharing of analytic trade craft, unity of effort, economy of force, trust and camaraderie between these different folks. Time and again, I see different aspects of security operations centers torn apart and put in very disparate organizations. And I rarely see it work out well, very rarely. Let me drill down a little bit more on one of those pieces. Let's talk about DevOps. Now, I'm not here to talk about Agile Scrum or, or any of the details of that. What I am here to say is, is, is you want your operators and your engineers in constant collaboration and or you want them to be the same person. The days of people mindlessly smashing alerts and flipping cases in socks are over. The days of having tier one people only smashing alerts are over. Even if they were with us at one point in time, some, people, some of you might argue that was never the case. I might agree with you. Let's talk tonight. So rather than thinking about the anti-patterns on the left-hand side of this slide here, think about those patterns. Think about that spirit of constant improvement in your SOC. There's different ways to achieve this. Sometimes is the SOC itself simply owns the engineering resources and the budget. I acknowledge, however, this is not always necessarily possible. So there's different things we can think about there. Think about a rotation. Think about saying, you know what? I'm gonna have a quarter of the engineering team on the SOC at all times. I bet you the way they spend their resources are gonna change dramatically as a result of that because sitting there and being confronted with hundreds of alerts every day is a transformative experience. And you can only describe it so much to somebody until they actually have to sit there and do it. Highly recommended. So think about the rotation, thinking about matrixing folks, think about matrixing back in the other direction. Think about staffing your sock in a way that enables your analysts to spend a percentage of their time doing engineering. There are some socks I run into where their, their SIM and their alert triage and their detections is actually a set of devs and they rotate one person into alert triage every day because they have tuned their alerts so strongly. Is that the way you should do it? Not necessarily, but it's food for thought. One way or another, you need to be tracking your requirements, stack rank them, do whatever makes you happy and have a set of specialists devoted to that. Number four. All right. Everybody's favorite here, hire and grow quality staff. And I say everybody's favorite because this really impacts us, our own careers, our own trajectories, who we choose to work for. You know, whether we bring our friends to work with us or whether we go follow them to their company. And so if you take a look at what I've got up here, you, as you can imagine, this is the before. This is not where we want to go. But I still see this in so many organizations. They're like, oh, we got to hire. We just lost Sally. It's time to get somebody else. We're going to throw up a wreck. We're going to ask for everything. And they're going to look externally. Like they're just not even going to consider internal candidate. And then when they get that person, when they find that person who is you know, willing to join the company who maybe doesn't kind of know the culture that's there, they go, oh my goodness, we finally got somebody. 
we have to keep them here. We can't let them grow. We can't them, let them go to another team. There are competitors. Like we have got to keep them focused on the thing that they're doing. And then they're shocked and surprised when that person actually leaves. Uh, and then they start to rant and then they go, oh my goodness, they took all of their knowledge with them. What are we gonna do? Oh, we gotta hire somebody. Let's put that wreck out there. Let's go get the person. But there's a better way and we all know this and that is you post that position and you make it available to both internal and external candidates and surprisingly i see this as a huge struggle for internal candidates to be considered in the same way as external ones you know and there's a lot of biases that go into i've known somebody for a really long time and so i know their flaws versus i had this two-hour interview they were pretty cool we should bring them in so be thinking about how you can provide equity into looking for those folks. And then if you're doing this the right way, you're going to enable growth. You're going to give those opportunities for continual learning. You know, you're going to make sure that that person doesn't just know how to do their job, has that opportunity to go be on the engineering team, has that opportunity to look around and see what they want to do. And because you're doing this, you're also going to pre-plan for the fact that people are going to move on. That is the nature of our industry. You know, unless you are completely new, you probably have not been with your company your entire career. And so as you're doing that, you need to be thinking within your organization, how do you maintain that institutional knowledge? What are the knowledge stores? What's the training that person can do? Because when you do that, then you can celebrate somebody moving on. And you can think about it as, hey, you know, that person's not running away from what we had. That person is running towards something that is really good for them. And when you do that, you are building a bigger community. I mean, I wanna bring up the idea of Carson, Catherine and I. We used to all be at MITRE. Uh, Catherine is, is still there. Carson and I have moved to other things. We're still collaborating. We're still building things that we can give back to this community. So it's a really powerful notion. So I wanna dive into a few elements here about hiring well. Um, I am certainly not the first to speak on this. There are many great presentations out there, but I wanna talk a about a few things that I find to be particularly relevant. Um, the first is your organization's reputation precedes you. So for any of you who are um, thinking, well, you know, it's okay, you know, I, I'll just go get some more people. Trust me, the folks out there, they're talking to their friends. They're not just applying to, you know, something that's online. They're looking to see what you have to offer. And so when you build those job recs, don't overload them. And by that, I mean, do not look for that magical unicorn that wants to be your SOC engineer and wants to do a little bit of threat intelligence and is like, yeah, I'll triage some alerts. Oh, you need a red teamer? Sure, I can do that too. And, um, oh, you wanna develop secure software? That, great, you know, that's, that's like my back hobby. I can do that too. Um, I have seen these wrecks. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for setting me up because they want to then pay them as if they were a part-time intern at Starbucks. So they are out there. Um, now, you might think, oh, I've got a small organization. Yes, you probably have to consolidate some of those job functions. You probably have to have people that do multiple things. Think about it from a skill set perspective and think about it, you know, so if you have an engineering element, that might be very different than your cyber threat intelligence, might be different from your analyst. Figure out what goes together and acknowledge you are not going to get the expert in everything. Figure out what is most important, second important, et cetera. When you go to hire, recognize, you know, or, or even, you know, promote from inside, um, recognize that people come into this industry in so many different ways. I was an art major in college. I am so in awe of what she's doing over here on the screen, over there. Um, but it took me a while to get here. I've worked with people who've been lawyers, who've been journalists, who don't have degrees, who are just interested in the field. You have to open it up and you have to recognize. I had a former boss who would not let us hire anybody who did not have a technical degree. Can you imagine how many people we managed to hire? Very, very few. Um, and, we, and it was funny because all of us sitting there were going, of the five people in this room right now, four of us do not have technical degrees. Did not make sense. Um, and I wanna keep emphasizing this look internally. Um, this is just something that I have observed over time um, again, we let our biases about what we know about people be overshadowed by the expectation and the excitement of something new. I mean, it's just, it's the way the brain works. 
And so when you're looking to move, you know, to have an open position, dig deep into your internal pool. This is how you keep people. You know, if you have a, a you know, a cloud engineering rec open and that person wants to, you know, move into that kind of space and think about, you know, how security happens in that space, help them transform. You know, if you've got somebody who's been doing SOC analysis and they're suddenly like, hey, you know, I've seen a lot of this threat intel stuff come up and I'm really excited in reading those reports. Move them over to that space. Um, and that goes into team member, uh, you know, growth and encouraging them to stay. You see the chart that we have up here? I wanna point out that we put those really big arrows side to side, as well as the little ones up and down, because it is so important to recognize growth does not happen just vertically. It really is about finding those other opportunities, finding that next challenge, seeing how you can apply yourself in different ways that keeps this interesting. So, you know, think about who you can bring in, think about how they can move across, and of course, then also think about whether there's that opportunity for them to move up in the organization. Obviously, we've discussed fair market pay. I don't think I have to tell anybody in this group about it, but you know, maybe we have some people that are newer to the industry. Um, maybe we have some folks that are going to see this who are like, yeah, well, it's not that important. Um, it is. You can go do market surveys. You should have your HR partners with you working on that. Um, and then the bullet on the bottom that I want to touch on is expanding your SOC capabilities. Because it is really easy to get frustrated if you are using that same Excel spreadsheet for the same data tracking for the same report that you wrote last year. And really, that causes a lot of burnout for your teams. And so think about how the technology can support the evolution of your SOC, which supports the evolution of your people. Because again, the more that they don't have to do by hand, the more they can move into those next interesting challenges and areas. And so it really is uh, you know, a growth opportunity to think about you know, how your capabilities fit into your staffing model. And so the one thing I wanna add on at the end here uh, is based on some experiences that I've had. So when I first became a manager that had a, a big department working for me, in the first 10 weeks, eight people quit on me one pretty much every week. Um, I kind of was like, okay, I don't think it's me. I'm new, probably all right. But it had me really take a step back and think about the fact that people move. Um, people are gonna change. You have to be okay with it. And so one of the things to think about is that that is not a negative. You need to build your teams as if they're gonna be with you forever. You've got to give to this community to get those people back that are gonna bring in the new skills that you're looking for, are gonna be looking for a different challenge that you have to offer. And so you can do that by preparing people as if they're gonna be there forever, but you also still have to prepare for their eventual departure. And so that goes back to that statement of making sure, you know, they're not a single point of failure. You may have a rock star, that rock star had better be able to document how, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it, the tools and systems that they're engaged with, the processes that you have. And so if you can do that, you can really plan for that life cycle and be okay at every stage because you know that that is just the natural cycle of how we're gonna work in this community. Mr. Carson. Indeed. Let's talk about incident response for a bit. Uh, if there weren't incidents, we wouldn't be here. Let me tease that apart. We think about preparing and executing effective incident response. We have our different types. We need to enumerate them. We wanna think about prioritizing the expertise that Ingrid talked about in the first strategy. We think about assessing the situation before acting and not taking knee-jerk approaches. If you've been in this industry at all, this probably is familiar to you. You, that user insight, that system owner insight is very valuable. In fact, I haven't encountered an effective SOC that didn't routinely, meaning every day, talk to their users and their system owners about what they're seeing. Of course, that has to be a balance. You have to think about how much time you're going to expend doing that in a non-emergency situation, but you get the point. We want to think about taking the time to conduct lessons learned, and I'm actually going to talk about that in the next slide. You've all seen, probably, the classic incident response pinwheel. Prep and plan, detect and analyze, contain, eradicate, recover, 
and post-incident activities. What I'm going to do for you is I'm actually going to decorate this with a bunch of pieces that go into this that, that um, you may or may not be thinking about. Starting with SOPs and playbooks. I don't care how senior or experienced you are, you should be looking at and improving your SOP documentation as a routine job expectation that you are doing at least a couple times a month because the diversity of the incidents that you were likely dealing with is large and the way you deal with those incidents is constantly changing. So you have to constantly be improving that documentation as part of what you do as an analyst, as a responder. When we think about detect and analyze, we have all this context we're bringing in. Think about building up your capabilities and maturity around building that timeline and common operating picture. All too often in incidents, we suffer from fog of war. One of the ways to deal with that is in your standard processes, designate an incident manager who's driving this. I know this sounds pretty standard, but crucially, that person's job, or perhaps another person's on the team job, is to draw a picture in real time, or maybe have some software that helps them do that, whatever. But the point is, is that you want that picture, that understanding the situational awareness of the battle space that everyone is rallying around. To all too often, I see people not doing this, and everyone gets confused. Build that picture. Think about engaging with those system owners as you go. When I think about being on a call for incident response, I'm gonna see about at least a third of the participants are people who do not wear security hats as their day job. They are people from other services who are engaging in understanding what's going on, doing investigation, doing engineering, and solving the problem with you. Here's the big one, and the area that I'm actually the most passionate about is as you're going along in your incident response, have a running record of the problems you are seeing. They're going to get sloppy, folks, and that's okay. Preserve that slop as it comes to you. Put it on paper in the moment. Come back to it afterwards. That list of draft post-incident response items, things you've seen that sucked, then you're going to have someone in your SOC or someone in your cybersecurity apparatus who is then responsible for recording them, tracking them, stack ranking them, and driving their closure. And that might be inside your SOC, and that might be with other organizations. This is one of your drivers for change. It's a big one because you can turn every emergency into that change. Number six. All right, threat intelligence. First of all, it's a little tongue in cheek, but it's actually surprising how much this part, you know, of SOC operations has transformed over the last decade. 10 years ago, there was no attack. 10 years ago, this was really reserved for the large organizations, you know, some cases, government organizations that were looking at intelligence. You know, there were starting to be threat intelligence platforms. There were starting to be data feeds. There was, you know, these things were there. But for a lot of small organizations, it really wasn't your focus. Recently, I had an opportunity to talk to a two-person SOC, two people. They outsourced a lot of their functions. They were primarily there for incident response and making sure, you know, they coordinated the activities. They knew what was happening. They said, hey, we're going to be getting a third person. And half of that third person's time was going to be spent on threat intelligence because they thought it was so important to really driving how you distinguish what is important in your organization. And so, you know, two people, third person wants to talk about threat intelligence. And so it is entirely possible for you to have a small organization and to be starting to think about this as something that is gonna be much more powerful in terms of what you're trying to do. And the power comes from threat intelligence being actionable. It goes back to our, our you know, statements as we've gone along. There can be this amazing report out there and it has no relevance to you. You can have leaders that are asking, you know, what about the, the situation you know, overseas, whatever situation is the latest of the day. And you're like, well, we don't do business over there. Um, and so it's not relevant to you. Um, 
they could say, oh my goodness, I just saw this vulnerability. And you're like, we don't run that application in our environment. Um, so you need to think about how you make it actionable, how you make it relevant to the kind of organization that you have. Remember that you know, asset inventory, composite inventory we're talking about in strategy one? Imagine if your threat intelligence team has act, you know, action to, um, access to that. They'd be able to think about that before they even brought up some of what they're seeing. We also want to note that your own data is a form of threat intelligence. The first thing to do might not be to go out and pay somebody else. You might actually be able to say, hey, you know what? I've seen these kinds of you know, USB worms are really prevalent in our environment. Maybe we should talk about that. Why are we giving people USBs that they're gonna take down to the local copy shop and come back with the piece of whatever it is that we don't want? Um, now you do run some risks because you see something, you say, we should look for more of that and you do, and you find it. And you're like, we should look for more of that and you do, and you find it. And you've created a little bit of a lens around you know, observing activity that you know is gonna be there. So you do have to think about what else you can bring in, but you can start with what you already know. When you do decide that it's time to bring in that additional information, keep in mind, somebody else's threat intelligence is not yours. You need to think about what industry are they part of? If it's coming out of a vendor, what's their angle? Are they trying to sell something? You know, why is this being put out into the community? Again, you need to think about, is it relevant to my organization? You know, why is it something that I might want to look at versus another piece that I don't? So you have to be very cognizant of all the biases that come in, you know, as you're pulling these pieces together. And there's an interesting discussion around association versus attribution. And so a lot of people still think, oh, I need to attribute this. I have to know who did it. Um, and they, when they're talking about that, they mean they want to know the person behind the keyboard. They want to know the country. They want to know the criminal group. They want to know who did this to me. But the fact is, for most SOC operations, association, that idea of it fits into this category of things. If you see this ransomware precursor, you are likely to get a piece of ransomware. You know, those types of generalist things can be much more important to a SOC than actually trying to think about who was behind the keyboard. Because this allows you to think more broadly about the categories of information that you want to collect on and when that's going to be relevant to you. Now, obviously, if you work for a government organization, again, you're going to have a very different viewpoint of this. But for most people working in commercial sectors, you really don't need to know that full attribution. And as you are seeing reports where people are attributing, you need to be really critical about the methodologies that they're using for that attribution. What are the things that they're associating? Why are they actually saying that it is this person, this group versus another? And then try not to get caught up in that because we all know that naming and threat intelligence is an absolute mess. Everybody has different names. Everybody has different code words. Um, many people have tried to create spreadsheets about all of this and none of them actually hit all of this stuff. But think about that attribution um, versus association and think about really the categories of information, the types of information and what is likely to happen next or what is likely to also be seen because you saw the piece that you saw today. All right. Uh, I, I think I mentioned spreadsheets a little bit earlier. Analysts that get really frustrated. You know, you're seeing the same spreadsheet. Threat intelligence is notorious for this. I have seen some majestic spreadsheets. They, are, they have pivot tables, they have tabs, they have colors. Nobody but that analyst can actually interpret what they actually put in there. But darn it, if you ask them a question, they are gonna give you an amazing answer. And so you do have to think about how to move beyond that. Um, how to institutionalize that information so that others can get to it. Um, and when you do that, think about it in the context of your SOC tools. Think about it in the context of that asset inventory. Think about it, all the other connections that you want to make. And recognize, again, this is a major engineering effort. Um, and you might not get it right the first time. I've seen a number of organizations that go through long, long requirements, documents, shell statements, will statements, should statements, and then they get the tool and go, huh, that's, that's not what I thought it was gonna do. So take the time to step back um, and start small again. You know, 
Try and get a trial. Try and figure out if there's something that you can do in this space to see if your data is going to make sense. Because the tool that your buddy uses for their organization is again, maybe not the right one for your organization. You have to think about what you're trying to do, the questions you're trying to answer, and the information that you want to present to others, um, and then think about how that's going to fit in with everything else that's happening. All right, I'm also going to talk about seven. Select and collect the right data. So I think there are very few analysts out there that if you said, you know, hey, I'm an engineer over here and we've got a new data source, would you like me to pipe it to you? Most people are going to go, heck yeah, bring that on. More data is always good. And then that engineer is going to come to them the second day and say, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing with all that data? And they're going to go, oh my goodness, I have so much data. I don't know what to do with it. I can't process it. What, what's, what's happening here? So it's a real mix between those two things. So again, you think about your data based on the organization you have. And you can do that through use cases. You know, thinking about, hey, is insider threat something that really matters to me? You're gonna collect different data if you're looking for insider threat than if you're looking at external activities. You're gonna think about what are my legal you know, requirements? What are those regulations? How long do I have to store that data for? And you're gonna build those use cases. Um, and then you're going to think about, okay, how do I then start filtering that information? And really, that filtering is going to come a lot from experience. It's going to come from, oh, we didn't have this piece of data when we went to do this incident response you know, activity. So you're creating your after action you know, looks and you're saying, hey, we should do this better next time. Um, but it's also going to come from what... Um, you know, you need to be thinking about what data is available to you. And I want to posit that we are in the middle of a transformation right now. So when Carson wrote the first book, network traffic was, you know, a thing. Um, but endpoint was really, you know, was starting to come along and it was starting to be talked about. And now, hopefully, most of your organizations, you know, are collecting endpoint data. But we're in another transformation where endpoint is no longer sufficient. And you have to start thinking about what it means to think about operational technology. And that operational technology isn't just for people who you know, are running nuclear power plants. It can be something like building automation. Do you know if somebody out there actually hooked up you know, an internet of the things thing into your network and what it's transmitting? You have to think about the role of identity. Identity is huge at this point. Because when you're talking about cloud and especially software you know, as a service, that may be the only indicator you have that something has gone wrong. Because you're no longer monitoring that endpoint. You're no longer monitoring the application itself. You're really monitoring those user activities within that application and looking to see who has access to it. Um, and I think that you also need to think about configuration. For many years, stocks were saying, eh, configuration information, not that interesting, that's an IT problem. But again, as we start to move away from endpoint being the only place that you can collect, sometimes looking at changes in configuration you know, are going to give you a set of knowledge that you didn't have before. And so I really want you to think as you're collecting your data, what are all those different places? You know, what can you actually bring in and should you be bringing in something that is different? Um, and with all of these, as we mentioned, it's a balancing act. You know, you've got to figure out like, Okay, I'm gonna bring in all the data and my systems are gonna get overwhelmed, so I'm gonna back it off. Or your opposite is, I'm gonna bring in a few pieces and I'm gonna build to see what I can do. Both approaches work, but you can't just assume that the data you're bringing in is the right place and that you're in the middle. And we wanna talk a little bit about um, kind of contextual sources versus actionable alerts. So you can be bringing in a ton of these sources. You can have log information, you can have all that configuration data, you can have media images. But if you don't have an alert on top of it, something that is basically analyzing that information, creating a detector on top of it, you are gonna struggle because you are gonna have that data avalanche and you are just gonna be buried, not able to, to come up. But if you only have alerts, if you have distanced yourself too much from the data source, you're never gonna be able to get to ground truth. You're gonna spend a lot of time spinning your wheel with suspicious activity. It might have been this, it might have been that, maybe this happened. And so you really want to figure out again, you know, how do you marry those two things? 
How long do you need to store that raw data for? How, you know, so that you can make action out of those alerts? How much time do you need to spend on creating those alerts, creating detectors, creating ways to look at that information in a way that is more human readable to make sense to it? And then that's gonna drive the volume of information, which is gonna drive your ability to process it, which is gonna make everything happier for you on the data front. All right. Some of the best analysts I've ever run into were so good, not just because they were good at looking through data, because they're very resourceful in using in place data that was generated, but not meant for security use cases to begin with. With that in mind, when we look at strategy number eight, integrating these different pieces together, I'm actually gonna skip some of this slide. Needless to say, pick your core tech, invest in it. Don't just buy it and put it on a shelf. Can practice continual improvement um, in the lifetime of that tool. Now, there are many vendors that have said, oh, we're your single pane of glass. <laughs> right? For those of you online, the room is laughing and so am I. Folks, there is no single pane of glass. What you can expect, however, is to take a deliberate approach to integrating a finite number of tools into a set of workflows that work for you. That set of tools, those workflows and how you integrate them look different for different socks. 10 years ago, when I was thinking about writing the first edition to put together an architecture that looked like this picture here, which I'm not gonna describe in detail, was most certainly a multi-million dollar affair. Today, not so much, thanks to cloud-based capabilities. We wanna think about how do we enable that analyst to start with those alerts, but pivot into that context? And they may have it in front of them in their SIM, but it may be elsewhere. Some of the best stocks I worked with in large organizations have a data estate that is composed of hundreds of disparate data lakes, hundreds, and they have access to them, which breeds its own set of problems, like how do you maintain access to all that at the same time? But that's not necessarily for, for another day. The point is, is that your analysts are able to pivot between these dark blue boxes, where they're able to get those other pieces. In fact, some of the best socks I've worked with spend as many engineering and dev resources, either the SOC or the cybersecurity organization, on building their composite asset inventory as they do their seam. Think about that for a second. Your seam may not be the start of the show anymore. Your asset inventory drawn from 10 different places may be just as important. Not many of you may be thinking about it. I would encourage you to do so. At the same time, we wanna think about balancing that sharing and protection. I run into um, socks that are completely open. Same identity plane, same network, full integration, two-way communications, et cetera, between the SOC and the rest of the organization. What happens when the rest of the organization, such as their main domain gets pwned? Can the SOC rely on their tools anymore? Not necessarily. On the other end of the spectrum, there are organizations that are completely closed. Think of them as a black hole of data. Give us everything, go away. Does that work? No. You have to strike a balance between these, this spectrum, these two extremes. Think about your risk tolerance. Think about how you want your analysts to engage with your constituents on a daily basis. Think about bringing those folks from outside the SOC into the SOC for hunt and detections. How are you going to engage them? How are you going to bring them into your identity plane in a way that is safe for you and for them? So strike that balance, folks. All right. This one is particularly relevant for all of us who are listening in to a you know, conference where we are sharing information. We want to give you a framework for thinking about this. And we chose the words of this title to really express three different concepts. Communicate clearly is really about all about that information sharing. You know, you need to give a report to somebody. You need to pass up a piece of information to your leadership. Collaboration is about partnerships. This is about finding those people in your own organization, other parts of you know, the community, who you're going to create a shared, you know, effort with. You're going to try and create something more than you could independently. And sharing is about giving out to the community and yet expecting nothing back. 
and really thinking about, you know, what do you have to offer with your unique perspective from what you have done? And so we think about those along three different tiers. The first of that is within your SOC. So this is where most people start. This is honestly where a lot of people stumble, you know, because there are so many different things that they can communicate about. But this is where having those shared expectations, figuring out your TTPs, having good shift log. This is all the stuff that you need to do to, you know, make your business run. But that's all on that, you know, communicate clearly piece. There's a collaboration piece in terms of your team working across. And then you also need to think about that sharing piece. You know, how are you going to encourage that senior leader you have in your organization to share what they know with other team members so that they can grow as well? You want to think about this with your stockholder, your stockholders, stakeholders and constituents. You know, so how are you going to provide information up that is going to get you the budget to go get whatever the latest widget is that your SOC needs in order to be better at what it does? You know, how are you going to then communicate, uh, you know, out the, the different things that your SOC is doing to different parties? How are you going to collaborate with that engineering team to make sure that the tools that they're providing you are going to be relevant so you create that partnership with them? And then how do you share? And in many cases, that might be you give a presentation to your company that talks about security operations, talks about the types of things you're doing, and helps them see why that's relevant. And then third, you want to think about this in the aspects of that broader cyber community. So in some cases, you're going to have reporting requirements that you know, are going to be that communicate clearly. Hey, I have to tell you that this happened to me. In some cases, you're going to have an opportunity to collaborate. There are working groups out there. There are you know, industry specific organizations that you can be a part of and that you could go and figure out like, how do we impact the regulations that are gonna be part of our industry? How do we impact you know, how we think about this type of a problem space? And then finally, there's sharing. And that's a lot of what we're doing here today, which is how do you bring that information to others that your organization might have? And even if you think like, ah, Nobody's gonna care. The fact is there is somebody out there that can learn from what you know. Even if you're new, there is somebody who can learn from what you know. So not saying this on behalf of SANS, but saying this on behalf of me as a member of this community, please think about presenting, sharing, writing, whatever your preferred format is. You wanna make a TikTok, fine. Many of us might not see it, um, but think about the ways that you can get, uh, get your information out there um, and make sure that it's gonna be available to others because there's so much that you might know. Number 10, measure performance to improve performance. Think about having some kind of metrics program in your SOC. Now, this doesn't have to be gigantic, but let's break that down. We think about our business objectives, our data sources, what does the SOC know? Think about your case management system, your SIEM, your engineering budget, your bugs, your code repos, all, all possibilities. How do you synthesize that data? How are you gonna report on it? And what decisions do you expect to make as a result? Creating a metrics program can be intimidating to folks. Be like, oh, this is a big field. In the book, there's literally pages and pages of potential metrics that you can employ. Don't try to do the whole thing, folks. Start small if, you, if you're not doing this today. How are we driving success? How are we demonstrating success to ourselves and to others? Make sure you are oriented on those positive behaviors. All too often, metrics go toxic when they drive bad behaviors. Think about that and how you implement. So we have metrics for both internal SOC consumption, for driving our own health, making those improvements, and for our external stakeholders, like Ingrid was just talking about. Right? We all know mean and median time to blah. Think about those other pieces. Think about our coverage of depth and breadth, for example. Number 11, turn up the volume. Think about some of those other uh, SOC functionalities that we haven't discussed so far, including hunt. When I say hunt, I mean forming hypotheses on where the adversary might be in our enterprise and going and finding them, either proving or disproving that hypothesis and along the way finding some things you probably didn't know when you started. Exercising the SOC all the way from red and purple teaming breaches of service, and tabletop exercises. We talk through all these pieces in the book. Digital forensics, a footnote in a talk about incident response. 
20 years ago, when I got started in this industry, incident response and digital forensics were like, that was the whole thing, right? Maybe you need media forensics, maybe you don't. Maybe you outsource it. And if you do choose to insource at least a little bit, we have some tips on how to get started there. Deception, which we're just starting to talk about, fascinating work coming out of our former employer. And then finally, malware analysis. When people approach malware analysis, they're like, they just get intimidated. Break that down into steps, folks. And those steps start with knowing how to run antivirus. Sounds simple, right? And on the other, on the other end of it is, is I'm amazing at Ida Pro. There's steps in between. All right. So we have the book. It's out. It's free. I don't make any money on it. Ingrid doesn't make any money on it. Neither does Catherine and neither does Mitre. You can download it at mitre.org slash 11 strategies. If you choose to go on other websites, which we don't endorse, that money doesn't go to us. That goes to the cost of doing business. When you go and do a print on demand, that's the cost of having printed out folks. So we're very pleased to bring this to you, the second edition. Um, and I'm gonna conclude with two quotes. This, the last one first. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you wanna get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. This quote inspired a phenomenon called the Red Queen effect, meaning um, in our context, if the SOC is maintaining its capabilities, it's falling behind and must constantly be iterating. I'll also combine this with a quote I picked up from William Gibson. The future has already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Your job is to bring your set of functions and capabilities, not just to the assets you know about and the businesses you know about, but your con entire constituency. Continue expanding and understanding that constituency because I guarantee you there are parts you don't yet know about. Push that envelope every day. Thank you.